a sign-in sheet is going around so if everyone can make sure that they sign in and that way we make sure I have some updated emails and we can get some information out to you on a regular basis. So, so one of the things we're doing a little differently, I know the last time around we were able to provide everybody with copies of the design details for our green solar infrastructure on the streets. We don't have those available yet for the work that we're doing in public spaces. We are working on a similar manual that'll have that kind of information and I guess we're looking for a summertime? We're looking for a 2016? 2016. 2016. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so not quite. Uh, yep. So this is sort of a work in progress. So yep. I guess what we'll be looking for feedback after Evan and Blair do the presentation is just some the work that has been done to date and any ideas that you have. So, okay, I didn't realize that one was a little, a little further behind. So we do have our Green Sorter Streets Design Manual online already. I think we sent an email out to them and let that know. So the entire manual is online. So if we have an opportunity to take a look at that, um, give us any feedback how workable that is, is it valuable, is it the kind of information you're looking for, because we're always looking to update that kind of information and, and particularly take the information that you have and the ideas and recommendations you have, because you guys do this kind of work, you're actually implementing it, so it's important, it's so important for us to have the idea of how constructible the things are that we're talking about. But as we mentioned before, I mean, we find that this is really valuable, having these sort of conversations with you. You are our ambassadors and um, we hear from our customers when we see when our contractors are working on the streets or working on our public sites, you know, they see you as us, which is very true. I mean, you're our extension, so we think that it really makes sense for us to communicate with you as to our intentions, our ideas, our mission, so they are truly our ambassadors and we can all sort of speak with a consistent voice. And when you hear things from customers, it's good for us to hear what you're hearing, provide us with that feedback. Our goal has really been to improve customer service, improve our communications with our customers. I think in today's day and age, we don't really have that choice. I mean, it's something we want to do, but people are getting, uh, you know, we're hearing information over Twitter, and Facebook, blogging. Hard for us to keep up with in, in some ways with that, but um, we see that it can really impact public perception, so very important for us to make sure that when we're in communities, we're respectful, we're clean, we, we do a job as if we live on that block with those people. So that's really our goal, you know, to sort of take that kind of information at heart. So, so we appreciate you all being here. I know how busy your schedules are and you're giving up time to participate like this. And your feedback is really valuable for us. So, but we're going to start with Junera. Right now I have the new um, release of our March Take Part newsletter. Uh, it features a few highlights, the city's overall 30% goal increase. Um, I know there are some concerns regarding that increase and what that means for contractors that usually um, bid as prime and how that would look like, especially in, in the water department type of projects, it's just with sewer and water. Um, those type of projects are pretty much 80 to 90% self-performed. So, um, I'm, I actually met yesterday with the Contractors Association of um, Eastern Pennsylvania. We're looking aggressively to see, you know, how does this affect you as a prime, if you're a prime contractor. And because I want to look at both sides, you know, the subcontracting opportunities and then also the primes and, and their concerns in um, doing our jobs. Um, so that's coming down the pipeline with creating a committee and, and looking at our contracts um, in detail and, and how we. Uh, work through the issue of subcontracting opportunities. Um, in addition, uh, the Philadelphia Water Department has revamped its website. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with its old website. It was a little bit archaic um, uh, in a sense of the <laughs> It was terrible. <laughs> we had a rogue site, phillywatersheds.org, which is still active, but you know, the Philadelphia like slash water was yes. something from the 1980s. It's had internet in the 1980s. Yes. <laughs> so we just recently launched last week. We went live. So that's a new um, portal that we have. Um, you go to fulla.gov forward slash water. It has all the tools that you need, um, you know, starting with paying your water bill, um, which is very important, and then also opportunities that we have uh, listed through the do business with PWD uh, section. Um, and it's very user friendly. Unfortunately, I don't think this site is Wi Fi, so we, you know, I would have loved to go through the uh, webpage with you, but um, you know, go and see the site for yourself. I mean, it's awesome. It's, you know, it has a lot of information. Um, 
as you see, I have my business card here. Please don't hesitate to call me. Um, if there's issues uh, regarding subcontractors or getting payments or even submitting certified payrolls, um, I'm able to, um, you know, mitigate, you know, some of those situations because um, I'm able to talk to a lot of people within the city government that are in charge of, you know, processing information. So, you know, use me as a resource. I'm here for that. Um, so don't hesitate to call me. I'm always available. Um, best way of communication for me is email. Um, it may take a little bit, unfortunately, based on the, the large volume of, of clients that I work with, but I will always get back to you. Um, that's a guarantee. Um, and I, I believe that's pretty much it. Any questions regarding participation and the increase in your concerns, and if you're interested in even um, participating, and um, addressing some of the barriers or issues around participation. Um, as of right now, if you want to email me, feel free to email me those concerns. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Excuse um, me. Sorry. We're just going to start off with kind of briefly repeating the beginning of last uh, the last presentation. To make sure that anyone who wasn't here is kind of caught up. Um, so everyone's here to learn about building green infrastructure, specifically this time around, uh, building green infrastructure outside the right of way. All these uh, SMP systems that we're installing are all to meet the goals of green city, clean waters. Um, the goal of that program would be to meet the um, meet the goals of our CSO program. So that's to prevent combined sewers, the older sewers in the system that take both the stormwater and the sanitary sewer, uh, and stop it from overflowing into the river. Um, along with that, we're trying to make Philadelphia a little bit more sustainable. So we have the option of doing a large tunnel uh, underneath of the city, uh, a couple of large tunnels, but we went this other way. And the reason we did that is we want to green the neighborhoods, restore the waterfronts, um, re improve the outdoor recreation spaces and then enhance the quality of life throughout Philly. So we took a triple bottom line approach, right? We get the, the environmental benefits, we get the economical benefits, but then there's a really big benefit to all the neighborhoods that we're impacting rather than essentially putting something underground that no one's ever going to see. Um, underneath of that, we have the combined sewer overflows, which I kind of went through, which is that our sewers are at capacity. Uh, during rain events, what happens right now is it fills the capacity and overflow into the river, which includes the river. Um, we have to comply with state, federal and state mandates to meet a certain target. Uh, so we have a certain amount of green acres we have to, uh, to create, which are basically a square footage multiplied by an inch, uh, and that's your green area that goes to each of these systems. Um, that'll give us uh, cleaner rivers and streams and then a greener city. Um, so kind of the question is, and why are we having you come in, is what's, what's in the program for you as contractors? Um, the Green Stormwater Infrastructure has $1.67 billion that we're going to be spending, um, with $345 million upgrades to the plants, and then adaptive management of $420 million. So there's money out there to construct these things. Um, what we need from you is a little bit of help in making sure that things are going in correctly, that things are going in efficiently, so we can keep this program moving. If we don't meet our deadlines, if things are becoming too expensive, this program goes away. And instead of having 20, 40 contractors working on these, we'll have one contractor building one tunnel, and that'll be the end of the program. Um, so the money's there, it gets spread out around everyone, uh, and we need your help making sure that things stay cost feasible, that things are going in efficiently, that things are going in correctly. Um, so today we're going to cover design and construction of SMPs outside the right of way. Like I said last time, we covered design and construction of SMPs inside the right of way. This is kind of a new realm for us. Um, it's probably a new realm for a lot of the contractors who are used to doing our water sewer projects. Uh, you'll be working in parks. You'll be working in schoolyards. Um, you'll be working, like I said, outside the right of way. And there's some things that you have to remember with that. Um, number one, our partnerships are important. We're developing a lot of relationships with PPNR, um, Parks and Rec, Department of Public Property, uh, the Streets Department, uh, School District, really anyone who's willing to work with us, we're willing to work with them. They're giving us access to their land so we can make larger SMPs that are cheaper. Um, 
they're giving us uh, funds where instead of just doing you know, a stone bed, we're doing a stone bed that's also a playground renovation or a stone bed that's also a new soccer field. So it's a really good partnership. It really helps out really the community uh, and makes that sure that, yeah, we're coming in and we're taking something away from them for a couple of months, but then at the end of the day, we're giving them something back better. Uh, we'd rather see these types of projects rather than the right away projects. Uh, I think it just, it's better all around. It's a more complete project. Um, one of the things that we'll have coming soon, 2016 is the date we have on the books right now. I would hope that it'd be a little bit sooner, but would be an open space manual. Um, so last time we covered the Green Streets design manual, and you guys got some design details from there. This manual will kind of be the same thing. It'll go through how to design a swale, a rain garden, a planter, things for the park. Uh, it'll also probably go through a lot more planting materials, a lot more soils, and probably a little bit more construction practices. So please look forward for that coming out. Um, so the Green Stormwater Infrastructure, SMPs, with the keep repeating stormwater management practices, uh, they collect the maximum amount of stormwater uh, in SMPs. That's one of the goals. Um, they we want to retain the water and allow it to slowly infiltrate into the soil, um, which sometimes when you're looking at a site is a little bit nerve wracking. You're taking a lot of stormwater, you're bringing it to one spot, and you want it to stay there. Um, so the goal of that to keep it out of the out of the sewer reduces the CSOs and then improves the water quality. So infiltrating kind of helps the water quality go. Um, if systems are designed and constructed properly, properly, the overflow and we'll kind of get into this later. The overflow I'm talking about is the overflow back to the sewer should rarely, if ever, be used. That's the goal. Um, you know, the soil should take a lot of that, a lot of the system, and infiltrate it down. Um, the basin itself should reduce the amount of stormwater uh, that's flowing through and how quickly. To the point where the amount of stormwater that we get going back to the, the sewer is minimized other than, other than in very large storms. Um, so this is a basin, or an example of a basin that we have. Um, this is probably one of the biggest ideas that we have for outside the right-of-way work. It still applies inside of right-of-way, but it gets a little bit more complicated when we're dealing with a larger space a bunch of different entry points into a park. Um, so you have here a rain garden, a stone bed. This is a domed riser, a highway grate. The highway grate goes off screen and goes to the sewer. So in here, you would assume you maybe have a trench drain coming in from the street, a parking lot that's running in, plus the grass areas around it that are all running to this spot. As it starts to rain, the, uh, the rain garden will start to fill up. The next step is it'll start to infiltrate into that soil. So as you can see, before it got to that dome riser, we wanted to go through the soil as much as possible. In a slow storm, the pipes and everything else should be secondary and never be used. You start adding in more uh, rainwater, it starts to fill up a little bit more. Until you get to the point where it does come and enter into the dome riser, down into the bottom and start filling in this pipe, and then fills in the stone bed. So at this point in time, really what's, you know, what's being shown here is either the system's at capacity, it's been a very long, slow storm, uh, or it's been a very, very fast storm. So we haven't had time to infiltrate through the soil. Instead, it fills up, goes into the dome riser. What's important to notice is that this rim elevation here, the point where it enters into the pipe, is higher than the soil elevation. Uh, we went over this last time, but it's going to be more important on our off-street jobs. You have your soil elevation. And then you're going to have an elevation that goes to the stone bed underneath. And then you're going to have another elevation which is either back out to the street or to the sewer itself. Uh, it's important that things are kind of stacked up in that order. And it's important that we understand that order. So when something changes in the field, when you know, we can't get a domed riser exactly where we want it to be, or something you know, is off on the plants, that we just at least understand that the goal is to have it set up so the sewer is the last place that anything goes. So what you're seeing here is that it continued to fill up. The system's at capacity, uh, like I said, it's either a fast storm or a long, slow storm. And we've gotten to the point where there is no more sto storage in the stone, no more storage in the soil. We're infiltrating as fast as, like, as we can, but there's more rainwater coming in than infiltration available. So you get to the point where it's reached that highway grade over on the other side. As a final step, it goes into that highway grade, and that highway grade could be that it's just going back out to the street uh, but in a lot of our, our larger rain gardens, what you'll end up seeing is a, a highway grade. You'll end up seeing 
uh, a larger domed riser that's supposed to take the 10 year storm. Um, the goal of our systems is to store and manage uh, a very, very small storm. It's the first inch of runoff, the first two inches of runoff. Uh, but then they also have the secondary goal of being able to transmit, not store, but transmit a 10 year storm or higher. Um, so that's where you'll see those highway grades. You'll end up seeing a 12 inch domed riser, maybe even larger depending on how big the basin is. Fills up to that point, and then it goes down and out to the system, out to the sewer. Um, this is an example of a rain garden. Uh, they're large when we get off site, so that's kind of one of the other pieces to, to remember here. You're not talking about a, uh, you know, something very very small, uh, like a, a bump out or something in the street. We're talking about taking over a full corner of a park, um, really adding something that is a noticeable feature in the park. Um, there's going to be swales that run down to them, there's going to be stone beds underneath, there's going to be a lot of elevations that are really, really important for us to hit. Um, it's a lot of stuff going on, and like I said, the, the main goal would be just to remember that, that kind of order of operations. We want to fill up the basin first, infiltrate into that planting soil, then down in the stone bed if we can. When we run out of room, we should be filling back up until we get to that dome riser that will go down into the stone bed. Potentially it goes to another basin. Um, but at the very last moment is when you want to be able to hit that sewer. Uh, so this is a plan view of, uh, of what a rain garden will end up looking like. So it's the cross section rather. Um, you have the soil on top, you have a distribution pipe underneath, you have a, uh, a dome riser coming down that distributes into the stone, and then a connection back to the sewer. Um, that was a simple one, and that kind of represented what we were looking at in terms of uh, the animation I showed before. This is a little bit more of a complicated system and a little bit more true to what we've been looking at. You're going to have multiple points of entry, so a, a trench drain here, a trench drain here. They're going to come in and they're going to fill in that basin up top here. Uh, along with that, you have the entire rest of the site, so everything over here is sloped this way. So we're not going to try to manage that, the drainage that's coming off the impervious area, but you as contractors, we as designers should be aware that it's there, uh, both to transmit and then during construction knowing that just because you blocked off this point and this point doesn't mean that you're not going to get the runoff from the rest. So that'll be something that, like I said, it's just important to notice is that you will have a lot of runoff coming from the site. As everything comes in here, uh, it dumps into this domed riser and goes up this pipe and fills in the stone bed that's underneath. So in plan view, this can be a little bit confusing because all you're seeing is a box of stone. You don't really know what it looks like. Uh, and then the grading for the top. Simplify it down a little bit. We are providing sections. So what you'll see here, um, it's not shown, or here it is. So right here, maybe we didn't make it on here. I think maybe here, there's supposed to be a line that continues out, and you'll see it inside the profile. There's an inlet on the other side of the street that's coming across and going into this stone bed. So that's another entry point that we kind of have to be able to manage. So by the time you finish the storm, you might have a stone bed that's at capacity. And you can see that here. So what you end up having is this stone bed underneath with a top of stone elevation, a bottom of stone elevation, a sand layer underneath, just like the tree trenches we've been building, just like the infiltration trenches we've been building. Two feet of soil on top, that's going to be the standard uh, inside of our design requirements. That's the maximum uh, that we're allowed to count for storage. Uh, so when we say that the, you know, the top of stone is at 100 and the top of soil is at 102, that's really where we want things because any extra soil and we're losing capacity because we, we're not counting it. Um, any less soil, we're again losing capacity potentially because now we are having, if you shift this down, you might not have as much ponding, you lost a little bit of that soil capacity. Uh, our stone is counted at 40% void capacity, our soil is 20% and our ponding is 100. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, it's kind of a, an accounting practice for us as we go through the design work where we are, if we're getting close and we're really just getting to that inch, all two feet of that soil, all two feet of that stone, and all six inches of that ponding are really, really important for the design. So what you can see here in this section, 
is this pipe's coming in and we'll start filling in the stone bed. At the same time, those trench drains that we saw in plan view are dumping stormwater into this basin up top, infiltrating through, this, through the soil. Once it gets to capacity, you'll have at this point, it'll go into the dome riser, down to the stone bed, and meet with the stormwater coming from across the street. There's also a highway grate in that design and an under drain. One thing to keep in mind, the highway box will have an out to the sewer, and the other side will have an under drain. The under drain will have a cap on it, just like we do with our tree trenches. It is meant to hold the water back in the stone bed. But then the other side is meant to be free flowing. That's to make sure that when we reach that storm capacity, everything just goes away, but we're not losing anything from what we're trying to hold back in the stone bed. Uh, that'll be one of the more important pieces of it. Like I said, these systems are meant to hold everything back until the last possible moment. Um, do you have any questions about the rain garden before I move on? How do you protect uh, pedestrians from this thing? They're often very steep on the sides, and I noticed that a project I just did that where um, you, it doesn't call for any fencing around it or mm -hmm. anything else, and somebody could fall into this thing mm -hmm. and tumble down the hill, so to speak. Generally, uh, what we'll see with our SMPs that are up against a footway or pedestrian area is about an 18 inch maximum depth um, and then a side slope that's not too steep. Uh, what we should be installing and what should be on the designs moving forward will be almost like a step off point. So there will be a point that will be lined with planting material um, that's flat. So if you step into that planting material, it's flat, it's just like the ground before it. Um, and then right afterwards is where it will go down. So we're kind of using the planting barrier along with the plants themselves to kind of denote where this thing is. Um, it's a hard balance because the plants themselves aren't going to establish for a while, but the plants are there and we choose plants that are going to be there year round to make sure that, you know, even in the worst of storms, you have a noticeable difference at that spot. Um, it's not perfect, you know, it, it definitely takes someone not deciding to roll into it, um, but it, it's the best that we can do. There are going to be times where we put fences around them. So if we're in a playground, sometimes Parks and Rec wants us to put a chain link fence around them. Um, it really kind of just bounces out depending on where it is. But in general, there's things to prevent, <coughs> as much as we possibly can, that from happening. Another thing is sometimes it gets missed. Um, if there's actually a shoulder from the other sidewall, it might have been a foot or two feet before the drop off. Mm -hmm. But you know, somebody who may not have been looking at the plans just bring it straight off the edge. Yep. So that's not being watchful yeah. create that situation. It's, it's, it's an important feature. We have a, a lot of pieces that go into the puzzle. Um, and a lot of things are, you know, kind of, I don't, they're, not, they're not intricate, but they're there for a reason, and they might not make the most sense. And that is one of them that, you know, the grading plans we put together, we got to stick to them, like I said, as much as possible. So for me, it's storage, but for our partners, it's going to be making sure that that step off is there that we have a little bit of extra barrier between a pedestrian on a sidewalk and our basin. Um, you're not necessarily going to see that when you get out into like a, an actual field. It's just going to be plantings. Um, but it, you're not really being directed to walk right next to it. Um, since you're bringing street water into public parks mm -hmm. and facilities like that that public uses, mm -hmm. what, are the, um, how, what are the measures that you're taking to remove or deal with heavy metals and toxins and chemicals in the roadways and yeah. stuff like that. That's that's the purpose of that SMP, is to, to deal with it. That's why we're using a planted system, and that's our goal with our planted systems, is to remove those 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 toxins. So they go into the plants? They'll go into the plants, uh, just like they would if they were along the right-of-way. Um, our systems are designed to have plants that are meant to deal with that. Um, they're hardy. They're meant to be uh, in a drought and then inundated. They're meant to be salt tolerant. Um, some of them are put in certain areas because they're meant to suck up uh, the chemicals that are coming in. In other places, they're put and they're not meant to take anything out uh, and this will just leave it in the soil. The other thing with our surface systems is that they do have a turnover rate. Um, there's going to come a time where they're overgrown or the soil's clogged or anything like that. And that's one of the really nice things about these systems is it's not buried. I can go out there any day, 
take off the top foot of soil, take all the plants out, put a foot of soil back in and plants back in and have a brand new system to some degree. Um, so when we got to the point where you know we were seeing a problem like what you're, what you're suggesting, that would be our remediation is going in, taking everything out and putting everything back in. Um, we do have uh, a couple of things that we're dealing with in terms of trench drains coming in where if it's going into a school site, they're gonna be, we're going to be putting sumps into some of them. So that'll take off some of your hydrocarbons, that'll take off some of your sediment that's going to go into the system. The first flush will end up in a box that'll collect some of that. Um, but in general, the purpose of these systems is to take that, that material out of stormwater, collect it and hold it, and then infiltrate the rest. Is there a reason you're not using um, more storage devices and, and just a lot of crushed stone? Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of what the, the purpose here is to have a system I can get to and is visible. So, we do use crates, we do use concrete arches in some of the systems. Our street applications are generally all stone, um, but wherever possible, our preferred method is to have soil to infiltrate through first, stone to in store in second, and then we infiltrate into the in-situ soil. Uh, it removes as much pollution as we possibly can, holds back the stormwater as, as long as we possibly can before it gets to the sewer, uh, and provides the largest benefit <coughs> on a triple bottom, triple bottom line basis back to the community. Anything else? Okay, so like I said, the, the, the goal of, rain, of the rain garden is gonna be the goal of pretty much everything else I'm gonna walk you through for the rest of the, the, rest of the presentation. Keep in mind, you know, like I said, sewer's the last place we want things to go. You're gonna have a swale, which we'll go through next, where you will have a domed riser in the middle of the swale. That domed riser is at an elevation because before it continues down the swale, we want it to go into that domed riser. Because maybe over that next check dam is the connection to the sewer, and we want to put it in our stone bed first. So this is an example of a swale. Uh, you can see here, there's an outfall here, and an outfall here, that one's coming in from the street. And it might be hard to see from the back, but this is dished out, this is dished out, and then it continues down this direction. So the simplest swale that we have is really just for moving stormwater from one point to the next. Uh, it'll be a simple grading plan. It's gonna be slightly sloped. It's gonna be grassed um, at every outfall coming into it um, or any place where stormwater is supposed to enter it will have some protection. It gets a little bit more complicated sometimes, but that's the simplest. Uh, you can see the cross section here. It's a five to one slope. Sometimes, uh, so if we are in an area where we have pedestrians or we have people playing, you'll see a much gentler slope, maybe a wider bottom. That way it's not as drastic of a change. Six inches of topsoil on the top. You'll see that go from that six inch mark if it's just transmitting down to two foot if I'm gonna to try to store inside the swale. Uh, and that'll go from, like I said, an outfall, uh, uh, potentially just a parking lot all the way down until it hits the uh, S&P that we want it to. This is a detail of a kind of a, a crossing coupled with an outfall. And this is probably what you'll see as far as the outfalls go. Sometimes it makes sense to have them be more formal, but more often than not, what we're looking for is kind of more of a natural look. We don't really want you to notice that there's an outfall there. Um, we don't want you to notice that there's a pipe. So there'll be boulders around it. Um, potentially it'll be slate, it might be stacked stone, it might just be boulders. Uh, the end of the pipe, for the most part, should be generally free, unless specifically said, you know, we're going to block this up. At that point in time, you'll have uh, stacked stone in front of it with leaf holes and an actual manhole structure on top. But like I said, for the most part, it'll be a free opening at the end. Uh, we're always going to probably have at that point, the reason we're doing the outfall, is because we have a uh, a crossing behind it. Um, so do keep in mind the grading leading up to that crossing is important. Um, and do keep in mind that the grading surrounding this is also important. We don't want to create a spot um, where we have to get the stormwater to rise up and out and then get to the swale, uh, unless there's a specific berm in front of it. Um, so it's probably a good idea maybe to put the pipe in, then dig down and put the swale in afterwards. Um, this is an example of a check dam. Uh, this is kind of in your, your, your cross-section view coming across. Um, what we're looking for is something in the way to hold the stormwater back. So as you're coming down the swale, 
you're going to hit a check dam and that's going to hold the stormwater inside of that section of the swale. So you'll have a, a slope coming down and then a wall basically in front of it made out of some material. The purpose there, like I said, is to hold that stormwater in place until you get to a certain point, overflow the check dam and go back down. Um, that's where you're actually storing. That's where you'll see two feet of soil. That's where you'll start seeing domed risers. Um, it's to really make sure that we can hold back as much stormwater from getting to that final S&P as much as possible. And when we have elevations on there, that's where things get really important. It means that the S&P that we have at the bottom is maxed out. Uh, it's not gonna be able to take this full storm flow. So getting those check dams right is really, really important. <coughs> Um, any questions on the uh, on the swales? Okay. Um, one of the other problems that we've been having, or uh, one of the pieces that we concentrate a lot on, especially with these vegetative systems that have grass that are soil, uh, are our energy dissipators. Sometimes they're called splash pads. Um, sometimes they are called the energy dissipator. But generally, the idea is that it's concrete with rocks. Um, sometimes it's bricks with a raised edge. The goal would be to take the flow that's coming off the street, coming off the parking lot, and slow it down. What it does is prevents uh, any type of erosion as it comes off the splash pad as much as possible. Um, they're a hard thing for us to put on the plans, and we're constantly adjusting the detail to try to get to a point where we're getting what we're looking for. This is a good example. Um, it's rough. Um, it's something that would be uncomfortable to walk on. Um, it's something that as the flow is coming down the curb line, when it hits it, it would immediately spread it out rather than channelizing it. This is an example of kind of what we're not looking for. So as you can see, as this came down, it hit this spot and continued through the rain garden and started chewing out a channel. Um, we don't want it to channelize. We want it to come in, you know, and go from a two inch strip down the gutter uh, or a one foot uh, flow coming out of a parking lot and spread out as much as possible and utilize as much space as possible. Like I said, this is, you know, a detail we put in. Uh, it's probably not the best detail. It's probably not the best design. We're, we're trying to experiment with these things. The goal moving forward, like I said, is to make it so something's in the way. It's something that the flow will have to stop and spread out before it gets past it. So here you can see it's just flat Belgian stone. Uh, what we would probably do there in the future is put a raised lip around the outside so it has to hit that, fill up, and then move out. Um, potentially turn some of these on their side so it's not just coming across and going down. It has to spread out and go around those raised stones. Uh, any questions on the energy dissipator? Okay. So this is a little bit closer to our, uh, our, our systems that we have for um, tree trenches. It's a subsurface stone bed. Um, it's sometimes the piece that's going to be connected to a rain garden, the swale. There are going to be times where we're in a soccer field and it's not appropriate to have something. So we'll tear up the soccer field, put this in, and put it back down. This is probably the system that while you're building it um, and while we're constructing it, uh, it's kind of important to remember where you are when you're working. Uh, the parks in the side of the city are someone's backyard. You gotta remember that at the end of the day when you leave the site and you have a hole that there's kids around still and they're still gonna be in this park. It's important with the rain gardens, it's important with the planters, but those are generally a little bit less steep, those are a little bit easier. When we get down to this depth, it's kind of the point where we're gonna start making some of our neighbors a little bit nervous. So just keep in mind that the site protection here is really, really important. Generally though, like I said, the goal is to put the stone in, probably about four foot of depth, build it up, cover it up, and go from this stone bed here with your uh, distribution pipe, a clean out, an observation well, to something like this where you can't see it any longer. You won't, it won't be there. Um, the clean outs are going to be off to the side. You know, if it's in a baseball field, it'll be outside the foul line a good distance. Um, if uh, there's trees, they'll be outside of uh, what we're looking at. Like I said the goal is to make it disappear because having an actual thing in place is not appropriate. This is a section that we have. Um, it's a perforated pipe, a stone bed. This has uh, asphalt on top of it. You'll see that when you get inside of your schoolyards. Um, what's important there is that we're not always sure what the pavement section in a schoolyard is going to be, so we try to take a best guess. We're gonna to try to make it you know, 
probably a little bit less than H20 loading, but be able to take the school's truck. Um, but we need to be able to match whatever's there. So if they've just kind of put down a skim coat, we're going to have to make the adjustment in the field somehow to have what we're putting back be appropriate, but also make sure that we can get our stone bed in. Um, this is just a uh, kind of just another example where you have something coming across street. It's going to fill up inside this inlet and then go into this distribution pipe out. In our parks, one of the reasons we're using them, and also schools, we have a lot more room. When we start to disturb a park, our goal is going to be to maximize the amount of storage we can get there. You'll see a lot of street crossings. Um, you'll see a lot of complicated elevation works coming across those streets. Um, and the whole goal is to get as much stormwater from that neighborhood into that park as we possibly can. We're going to do it in a safe way, like I said, being able to convey that 10 year storm or larger. But these, these elevations getting across here are important. Uh, and then making sure that this inlet is parred so we can actually fill up to this point and get across is important. Um, it's not going to be the easiest work, um, but it's really, really important for us. It makes it worthwhile to say to a neighborhood, listen, this corner of the park's out of commission for the next three months. Um, if we're just doing a street adjacent, which will happen because sometimes it's all we can do, uh, it's kind of a little bit of a downer for us because, you, like I said, you're taking something out of commission for three months uh, that everyone uses. Um, so, some of the common misunderstandings that we have with on-site stuff, and we haven't yet really heard this from the contractors, we're hearing this from our partners more than anything, um, so we're sure that, not sure, but we just want to make sure that we know what's going on. Um, the systems are not designed to remove the water from the site quickly. Like I said, they're supposed to hold everything back as much as possible until the last very second when it enters into the sewer. The planted systems are not intended to be fully functional right away. It kind of... It's not the best, you know, having what is a less sparse looking system. It'll take two growing seasons to fill everything in, um, but it's kind of what we end up with at the very beginning. You're going to get questions from the community members about why things aren't filled in a little bit more. Um, you're going to get questions about how these systems function, and that's something that's going to be important to notice. Yeah, it looks like this now, but in two years, this will be filled out. Uh, and I'm sure Blair will go over later that we don't necessarily want the stormwater flowing into this thing right away because it's not fully filled out. Um, and their plant systems not intended to be fully mature. Uh, so I'll pass it off to Blair now, who's going to go over to construction. Um, any questions before I uh, pass it over to Blair? I, I kind of have one yeah. about parking lots, existing parking lots, and regulations that PWD is in, involved with <coughs> large areas right now. And that, and there's an incentive program, I believe, for for stuff like mm -hmm. that, right? But are there any requirements for um, parking areas like these, the, the big parking companies and maybe big condominiums that have non-porous yeah. parking areas that are required to do anything, put in their own personal They are not required if they exist. So if they exist right now, they're not required to do anything. <coughs> if they do do something, they get a reduction in their storm credit. Control. So there's an incentive to it. Um, if they're going to go build something new, and they're definitely required to do something. Um, so there is an incentive program out there. Uh, it goes th through a couple different channels, but eventually the, uh, the idea is that they can, different plans, different uh, implementation programs can come to us and say, this is what we want to do. This is how we want to fix this site. Um, and then we're able to provide uh, some amount of funding for that program. And is there, the, it, what is the, how easy is it? If uh, APM wanted to come to uh, the city, to PWD, and say, "Look, we have this. We have all these parking lots, and we, we want to take this on." What's the process? Is it? Is there a lot of red tape? Like what? For for, go through? I mean, for the for I mean, the, it's a city, right? Yeah. But but I mean, the, is it making it easier? If all they want to do is implement and do a parking lot, right? And they're they're just gonna, willing to fund it on their own. That's a relatively easy process. You well, go to design, I mean, acceptance and all that stuff. How, how is PWD working with? We work with, so we have a review uh, team, stormwater review team, that does all of those pieces where you send in and submit what you're looking for. They review the plans and let you know if you meet the requirements. There's a manual out there that tells you exactly what you have to do. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's relatively easy. Do, I guess what I'm saying is, do you keep it 
it, it can PWD take on a role where you keep it from streets, you keep it from L and I, you keep it from all these entities that kind of you know buckle so I mean, down on it. To a point, uh, if you're going to be going and doing a let's say a condominium, you're going to let's just yeah. say a parking lot, like the, let's say a parking lot company. Yeah, then it, then it's it's on you and it's your property. Uh, so as long as you're meeting the requirements of L and I, you just have to meet the requirements of somewhere planning to do. And you could expedite it through yeah, L and I. Are there yeah. programs through PWD that can yeah. expedite through the other channels of government? We no. work with them. No. Yeah. I mean, we work closely, yeah, you know, as I've been saying, with L and I and, yeah. um, and streets and others, so we can we can ensure that we're working on a project, we can contact you know, the liaison yeah. of the other department yeah. to make it smooth, we can make permitting go away. Yeah. I mean, right. if, you're, if you're just talking it's about a parking lot though. <coughs> I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about like if there's money available for PWD and and we're all committed to managing our stormwater in the city beyond what anybody else yeah. does in this country right now, mm -hmm. which we are. Mm -hmm. um, could some of the money be put into an expedition process that would stop all the red tape from all the other entities that get, like to get involved in the city? You know, yeah. I mean, it's a benefit for you. It's a benefit for all of us, right? I mean, I would yeah. love to say yes, but I don't. Yeah, I, I think, think we're going to get there. Yeah, exactly. But we right. are still yeah. looking to streamline. So yeah. the more work we do with retrofits and with private partners, right. the better we get at it. So we're still, you know, we're still pretty new at this. Yeah. And uh, identifying with you all what the challenges are. So right. our goal is to sort of knock those challenges down so they're not quite so challenging. Thanks, Joy. In an effort to um, advance the industry, those of us who are doing GSI, which I guess is all of us, and also to further the, um, further address the concerns you were raising before about public safety around these sites and education about the nature of what's getting installed, because I'm mm -hmm. assuming a lot of the times what's getting installed is not like a pretty flower garden of lilies, but plants that are selected because of the way they manage stormwater, does the, is there, and I don't, I don't know if this vision or not, but does the education and outreach element of the, of the water department, can they help us <coughs> on site? I know signage and stuff is expensive, but I'm wondering um, if there are strategies to a, uh, advance or promote the companies that are doing green instead of gray, for starters, and, well not for starters, but that's secondarily, but, but also primarily to help educate the community about not only the safety around these sites while they're being constructed, but also uh, that you know you interact with these sites differently once they're built and they're working. And here's how they're working: get them excited <coughs> and educated. So, how, can you talk to us a little bit about? And maybe that's not for this form; it's not it's fine. But how you would interact with us during that process yeah. to help? Yeah, no, definitely we'd love to do that. We um, work closely on our own projects and whenever a green stormwater practice is going in the streets or in other places. Uh, we work very closely with our design team and construction to make sure that we do outreach in that community, outreach to the neighbors, uh, make sure there's plenty of information that we can hand out. We we'll also have information online and we are working on signage. So our goal is for all the very public places to have nice yeah. signage about how these systems are working and what's going on here. So that should be a an element of the way we think about oh, these jobs is how are right. we interacting right. with, yeah. with you guys on that. So, so we would love to, I mean, when, even if you're not doing our project, but you're doing green projects, we would love to share information so we're all consistent with right. public messaging and certainly to make sure that the more information we get out to the public about how these systems work and, and gain public acceptance, because as Evan was saying, I think what we're hearing from a lot of people is they don't look nice mm -hmm. right away. Which is, I think, they're disappointed, and so we're trying to learn to manage those expectations that we, we show these these beautiful renderings of this incredible site, which might not look like that for another two years, and they're like, well, you, you sold us a bad deal. Yeah. Or it might so, not ever look like what they have in right. mind. So we need to. So I think, yeah. So I think it's really important for us to say, here's why we're picking the plans we're picking. Here's how they work. So, Joanne, are you the like point? Yeah. So today? for the outreach okay. education, yes, yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anything else before we pass the floor? I had a question in regard to uh, the two slides previous where you were showing the rain garden and you were showing the 15 inch HDPE, which I believe was perforated. Press it back. Uh, there you go. 
right there. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered about that, and I think this gentleman alluded to this earlier. Is there any benefit to having, you know, more pipe in there, larger size pipe, as far as your volume calculations? There is. Um, we've gone through that before, so I've looked at uh, mm -hmm. the cost coming from you guys in terms of an 8-inch pipe, a 12-inch pipe, and a 15-inch pipe, mm -hmm. and the amount of storage that you increase by, and the cost just doesn't necessarily work out. Okay. Um, it's, it's pretty close. Um, the other thing is that we're going to build towards a loading ratio. So our loading ratio is for every uh, 10 square feet that we have inside of the coming out of the drainage area, I have one square foot of SMP. So the larger you make your voids, the more stormwater you can store in a condensed space. Uh, the worse, not the worse off we are, but the least effective uh, the practice is the more trash loading that's, that's going to get there, uh, it's, the system's not going to last as long. <coughs> so when you put in these larger pipes um, into a system, which you'll see, you will see on some of our designs because we're just taking in that much stormwater, um, you're taking that loading ratio and really kind of shrinking it down and getting to that point where it's a little bit uncomfortable for us. Um, that being said, what we're potentially thinking about doing to make maintenance a little bit easier, maybe make construction a little bit easier, is to reduce the length of the pipe by a lot. Get it to about five feet and make it really large. So make it that full 15 inch diameter. That way, instead of having an eight inch pipe that runs you know, 20 feet, that runs 100 feet, you have a 15 inch pipe that runs for about five. From a maintenance point of view, that means you can reach inside, grab everything, and pull it back out, which is awesome. Um, from a distribution standpoint, our goal is to get the first inch of runoff. But our design storm is a, a quick and intense storm, but something that if you have a large diameter pipe and you have a good amount of length to it, it'll have enough to kind of distribute through that stone, especially since stone distributes pretty well. Um, but yeah, I, we, have, we have some projects coming up that'll be chambers. We have some projects coming up that'll be large diameter pipes. Um, it's not our goal, but sometimes it's the reality of where we're working and that's what we have to do. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, if we're talking about 85% of the designs that we're looking at, you're going to see an 8-inch distribution pipe, a 12-inch distribution <laughs> pipe for a larger system, <coughs> and a lot of stone, some soil, and some ponding. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, Blair? Just trying to uh, consolidate this into four points on the construction issue um, on building on off-site locations or off the right-of-way locations. So existing utility issues, the limited disturbance that you're going to be working in, erosion, sedimentation, pollution control, and the property owners and the neighbors. These are not all the issues you're going to encounter building out of the right-of-way, but um, these are four basic ones. You'll find most of these are addressed differently in our specifications. If you're used to using regular on-street water sewer, even on-street green, there will be special verbiage in specifications dealing with all these issues. So you want to pay attention to that, especially when you're bidding a job and constructing a job, refer back to them. Oftentimes they'll require you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Um, extra protection measures, fencing, safety, um, more ENS control, more like a private job where you're building a building for a, a private entity. Uh, one of the things you'll find different, especially for our street contractors, is uh, the existing utility plans are from uh, public property, they're from old schools, churches that were converted to schools. <coughs> um, graveyards that were turned into schools, that were then turned into parks, that were turned, there's mixed uses, so you'll find lots of buried utilities there that you wouldn't expect that there aren't good records of. Uh, during the design process, they scour all the records, try to get as best they can get, and put them on the plans, but you're going to run into things that you weren't expecting. Um, the plans that they do find are available. Uh, they should be part of the specifications. If you want the copies of them, we recommend you, you ask for them before you start digging, before you start doing, to see what they were saying. 
and make sure they're you know, transcribed correctly because bottom line, you know, you're going to hit them, it's going to cause a problem for you as a contractor. Uh, most of these uh, plans don't get your normal one call. So everything within the private property, nobody's marking out for you. It's up to the contractor to either mark it out or sometimes in the contract now we have utility marking services as a pay item. A con a, you get a subcontract comes in there, put the tone on the line, maps out all the copper, tries to map out the sewer, marks it on the ground. Unlike one call, they're not going to come back unless you're paying for it. So it's up to your, your, your guys who are working on the site to maintain those marks. If you eradicate them, put them back. It's, it's important. It saves you effort because if you break something, it's got to be fixed, especially if it was known there. If there was a, a water line that was shown and you break it for the water fountain that's only used in the summer, it, you're probably going to have to repair that or fix it. And the park will want them... You know, they don't want to splice in the middle of the playground. It's not going to work. They're going to want a whole new line. Same thing with electric and their communications. Um, you're going to encounter the regular water and sewer, as I talked about, but there's also going to be communications lines, both aerial and underground, that were done on previous projects 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. You want to make sure you know what you're hitting when you hit something. Usually there's a difference in materials. You'll see a different trench. You'll see concrete encasement. <coughs> Don't assume it's abandoned. Um, ask the question, what's this? Does it match up with something on the plan? Maybe there's a stray line there. Maybe one of the old plans shows something. Take the time, go, okay, what do I have? What am I encountering? Did I break it? Is it, is, is it in good shape? If it's in bad shape already, you know, there may be a way to, to work around you know, the repair of it. It might be a, di a different method. We've done everything from uh, relay underground electric to aerial as part of the process because it was cheaper to do it aerial and the park didn't mind it that way or the school district didn't mind it that way. It gave them a new service and then you can dig through what was there. Um, and then if you can dig through with it, you can. Uh, the one in the picture here was an electrical line that was supposed to be over and up and of course they did it diagonal. It went right through our construction site. Just happened to run a, a pool. And we were digging in the spring. And guess what? They're going to want their pool soon. So we had to come back and replace that whole line beginning to end to, to fix it for the park. Um, this wasn't marked on the plans. Had it been marked on the plans correctly, it would have been the contractor's responsibility. Questions about utilities or where, where you can get information about them? or. Limited disturbance. You'll find the park guys especially um, really big on, on this whole issue. Most plans coming out now have a sheet where you have a defined limited disturbance around your site. And this is one of the off-street off jobs that we're working on now. That limited disturbance, mm, there's not too many reference points there. There's not survey accurate data points that goes around there. So the first part of the job is to go out there and mark out the limited disturbance with the property owner, be it Fairmount Park, School District, or whoever. We agree at the beginning of the job, this is your limited disturbance. If you have a problem with it, or you want to say, how about we move it over here, it makes my access easier, they'll work with us on that. But once it's set, that's it. You, you want to keep that limited, keep your work within the limited disturbance. You want to stake it out, you want to fence it if it's calls for in the specifications. You want to safety off that area. But once we agree to it, that's really what we want to work within. Um, the park will assist us in moving. They'll make a, a decision in the field to, to increase the area or decrease the area. But once that's set, you don't want to go outside of that. Because if you do go outside of that, let's say you put in an access road or something like that, you're now contracting the soil, you're bringing in stone, you're changing the, the soil profile. For the, for the tree guys and the grass guys and the plant guys are going to go, no, you can't do that. And you end up ripping that all out to additional cost. The restoration of work outside the limited disturbance is way beyond what you think you would need to do. And they'll hold you to that. And I'll hold you to that. And everybody else will too. Um, once again, maintain the limited disturbance markings, um, restoration, and protection of trees. You'll see oftentimes they'll pick out particular trees that they find valuable um, in, in the sense of, of landscapers. 
this tree is valuable, that tree is junk, and they want to they want to protect them. There's usually plans and specifications within the contract that show you exactly how you're doing that, where the fencing goes. Put those things in correctly. Stay away from them. Because once you start getting in, then they talk about value of that tree that you've damaged and, and rest restitution for the value of those trees that you've damaged. Questions about landscaping? Or limited disturbance? I'm sorry. Erosion and sedimentation pollution control. We don't do that much on our street jobs. Um, you're digging in an impervious area. You're trying to keep your dirt close in. You sweep into the trench. You keep your area fairly clean. When you get into off-street areas, it's a whole new ballgame. Those of you contractors that work on private construction, you'll know all about ENS. There's an ENS plan. It's been reviewed. Many times there's net these permits, depending on where you're at. Uh, it's gone through our stormwater plan review if it's a large enough area. They, they're, they're pretty well set. They give you a contractor a, a starting point for where to put their ENS measures. Um, it's also the contractor's responsibility to uh, cope with issues with those plans that aren't exactly correct. So you might have to make some changes, put some more silt fence in. Other areas can be brought back. It's, it's a flexible moving target. And as your contracting operations changes, you have to deal with those changes. You may want to do it one way, somebody else may do another. The plan's a general plan. Uh, with our jobs and even with the jobs that are done under private bid, uh, we have the all ENS measures to be installed before the job gets started. And that's true with all private jobs, but we're bringing that onto the, the city jobs and water department jobs. The big one with ENS is soil migration, and that's really what it's trying to, to stop. We want to keep the soil on the site, not have it tracked down the road, not have it tracked or washed into neighboring properties. Uh, most of these sites are within park areas. They don't want the, the runoff going into their park, into their streams. So you'll find measures both to keep soil from moving outside of the area, as well as from entering into your stormwater management structure that you're building. I think there's one picture Evan showed had a large stone square basin and you had the swale, the rain garden in the middle. You have an, a disturbed area that's graded towards your swale. Well, you have to actually keep this, the area from your own site going into your own swale. You have to put up silt fences, put up um, silt socks. You have to do measures to keep that site clean. You'll see areas where, um, my picture's missing from here, uh, you'll see areas where you want to keep your site free from outside soil. It may not have anything to do with your site. You may be really next to a ball field. And when it rains on a ball field, you have runoff with mud. Um, I think some people have had, had issues with that already. You want to actually put up measures to keep other people's soil from coming into your area, if necessary, because then you're not meeting our contract that you you're, you're don't have a clean wash stone anymore. And they're all measures you don't really encounter in the street. Um, and you want to protect the existing property. If there are features like a basketball court that's next to your uh, project, you don't want all your dirt running into the basketball court. You don't want um, I think other, other examples, your, your <coughs> soil are running into areas within your own property, within the property that you're working in. Um, and once again, for ENS measures, you want to make sure you start with the plans, but then you want to modify it as necessary so that you don't track soil on and off and that you're, you're making the proper protection for the, what you're building. Questions? And you also be familiar with ENS measures. And last but not least, we're working on someone else's backyard, literally. Um, whether it's a, a resident or homeowner that's adjacent to it, or it's a school where there's a principal and an assistant principal and children, um, we want to be conscious that this is not a regular street job. You don't want to take liberties there, or you know, even the language that your guys are using in the middle of the schoolyard. It carries through the windows when, when, during the night when they have the windows open. 
you're working in, in park areas where people are playing basketball and, and baseball and soccer and you know kids just running around. So dangerous objects that normal adults would go, oh, I'm going to stay away from that. Kids run underneath backhoes. They don't care. Um, it's, you want to take that extra measure to, to watch out for them above and beyond what you would normally do because of where you are. Um, most of the specifications will say, you know, put up a fence, put up iron safety fences, whatever. That will get damaged on a nightly basis if you're impinging upon that nightly basketball game that, that's always there. So you might want to take measure, okay, maybe I'll need to modify this. Talk with the people, say, I'm going to do this, you know, keep your ball here, or if the ball goes in here, watch out. Uh, if there's a, an issue, there, you know, you'll get the phone call in the middle of the night that, you know, your fence was down, or there's a problem, or there's a safety issue. Uh, most of these properties will be u in use through the construction process. You'll have schools. Um, you'll have playgrounds. <coughs> all time, all times of the year, they're using them. You'll have people there. Just, you have to pay attention to it and take take precautions. Most of the specs will call for those precautions to be implemented, but you may need to do more. You may, instead of putting up orange safety fence, you may find it better to get temporary fencing and, and put it up, wire it up to keep the ball from bouncing over. Um, there's families and children nearby. Children get into everything. If there's an opening, they're going to find it. They're going to make their way into your construction site, either on during the working day or after the working day. And then keeping the site clean and presentable. Uh, half the complaints that Joanne gets are about, oh, they left trash, you know, in, in, you know tied to a fence. They left uh, debris <laughs> on the corner, and it, you, know, it was, you know, the kids were playing, and they, they piled up a big pile of stone, and you know, kids are now throwing the rocks on there. It might be as simple as just putting plastic on top of your storage and materials. Might even your your pipe and whatnot, just putting you know a tarp or contractor plastic on top to keep the, you know, the curious from going through it. These little measures at low cost will save you a lot of headache later on when you say, okay, you got to clean this up or you can't store it here. The more we take precautions now, all these entities, especially schools and parks, talk to each other or you know, on, on different projects and they'll go, oh, it was a mess, don't do that. If they say, oh no, they kept it covered up, it's not a problem, you can let them have this area in your parking lot for you know, your, your temporary storage of soils and whatnot. So as we do better jobs now, it gets easier later on. If we make a mess of it now, they're going to say, oh, no, you can't store any soil here. Now your costs go up, our costs go up, the program costs go up. Um, it's little things that make the difference. And you also want to pay attention where you're working. If there's you know, a stream that's used, especially on the West Hicken for fishing, you want to know that that's in use and there's a trail there. You want to make sure there's an alternate path it should be in the plans and specs to do that. If it's not, you want to be aware that people want to use these things, especially during the nicer weather. Um, what's going on around there? Is there uh, events going on? They, you know, a lot of times when we have our pre-cons, we invite the entities in that, that run the thing, run the, uh, the property that we're working in, from parks and recs or from schools, and they'll tell you, oh, we're having a fair this day, or we're having a celebration on this day or graduations this day. You may have to clean up a little bit more during that area so that when they have those events, it's safed off, it's clean, and you're putting a good face on there. And they see you working with them, they'll work with you. You need something, you know, water, or, you know, you need, you know, their facilities or something like that. They may cooperate with us. Um, this is yours. Out of, out of order. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm done with that. Is there any questions generally about the construction that you might want to uh, <coughs> ask about, especially out of the right of way? So just to go over everything kind of in summary, um, design construction of SMPs outside the right of way. The SMPs are designed to collect the maximum amount of stormwater, not let it go back to the sewer. So like I said, we keep saying it. 
it can't get to the sewer until the last possible second. Um, the off-street SMPs right now, we usually do rain gardens, swales, subsurface basins, all of those things working together. Um, so that kind of makes it a little bit more complicated. You're not going to just see a tree trench. You're going to see a tree trench that's connected to a rain garden that's being fed by a swale, and then maybe upstream of that there's another rain garden. Um, so there's a lot of kind of moving pieces and elevation dependent pieces. Um, and then the plants themselves, they're going to require time to mature. Um, that's kind of just a good tagline to have out in the field. If you're going to plant something, you're going to have a, uh, someone from the neighborhood kind of come up and say, you know, why isn't it bigger? When's it going to fill out? And you kind of start to explain, you know, this is what size they are now, but they'll grow in. This will fill in. It'll take two growing seasons, but it'll get there. Hey, Evan, uh, yeah. can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. um, who maintains the gardens? Is there is there a maintenance program mm -hmm. that is P PWD hires contractors for mm -hmm. landscaping contractors to <coughs> go in? So, so right now, um, there's two ways maintenance happens. Um, if it's a true partner project, I take care of the subsurface pipes. PWD will take care of the subsurface pieces. <coughs> um, the surface itself might be taken care of by whoever owns the property. Uh, so Parks and Rec will have their landscaping teams come out and do the surface features. The school, same thing. Um, if it's us using property and it's just ours to maintain, um, we have a maintenance crew that has people who come and clean the inlets, clean the piping, do the landscaping. Uh, right now, that's all out on a contractor. Um, that's That was went out to bid uh, a couple years ago and just continuing through. Um, so there is a chance for that to change in the future. Uh, that program to expand and have to expand to some degree. Um, and we're going to be looking potentially at how these, how these change. So, thank you. Yep. Um, the best practices, as Blair went over for GSI construction, <coughs> you want to minimize your disturbance. You really want to stay kind of inside of whatever's set in front of you. If the school says you have this area, we have to figure out how to stay in that area. As designers, we're going to do the best job we can to document that. But when you get out to the field, you know, this year they changed the principal, and that principal might have a different opinion. Um, we can come and help you through that discussion of where we get to stockpile things, uh, but only to a point. And at some point in time, we might just have to deal with a smaller stockpile area. Um, when you, moved. yeah, or, or relocate, they yep. may want you on the other side of the schoolyard yep. or something like that. Um, when you encounter utility, stop. Uh, the schools, the parks, they have plans, but that school has was one property for the past 20 years, before that it was another property, before that it was another property. There are going to be things that are not well documented. Uh, we're going to depend on you inside the contract to go out and do utility service locations and do the best you can through your subcontractors to identify things. During the design phase, we're going to put down an SMP and we think something might be there. We're going to do ground penetrating radar. Uh, we're going to do our own utility location services. We're doing the most that we possibly can to make sure we get as much information to you but I can guarantee it's not always going to be enough. Um, so just be prepared to potentially hit something, and when we do, stop, figure out if it's live, figure out if it's going somewhere, uh, talk to the property owners, determine the best way for us to get everything back in service. Const uh, through construction, and we'll figure out how we need the final product to be. Um, the biggest thing is, like I said, remember, and Blair pointed out too, this is someone's backyard. This is someone's you know, kind of rec room in their basement. If you knock out the power to a recreation uh, building, that building now, you know, can't have that basketball game tonight. We kind of got to get things back in service for them as quickly as possible. Um, so we have five minutes left. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was get some feedback. Uh, so I could do it five minutes if we have any major points anyone wanted to touch on in terms of, let's talk maybe plan clarity, since that seems to be a point that I know that, as a designer, we'd like to try to improve. Is there anything majorly on our plans that we're missing that you guys would want to see to make things a little easier? So our plans are perfect? Wow, <laughs> that's good. You gotta like it. Um, is there anything inside the designs, just in general, that we're seeing that maybe we have questions about that um, you know, are unclear? Uh, that the intent just isn't getting across, maybe not understanding why we're doing the program a certain way rather than another. I know we talked about, you know, why are we using small pipes and more stone and more soil than structures. Alright. Where was that information available since I missed the last meeting? Uh, that should be on, is that on the Office of Watersheds website? 
Um, it's on the actual website? Uh, okay. Okay. So it's on, yeah. Yeah. Question for me. I, I, um, it's more of a point out. When you see the plans, there's usually a good grading plan. However, there's also a good detail plan. I think one of the gentlemen in the back, if somebody had said something about that step off, I know you had something about the step off. Um, there's details that show exactly how things work in, in very close, and then there's a general grading plan. So you want to not just go to the grading plan, you want to look at those details, <coughs> combine them in, into a usable thing, and, and it comes down to the design intent. Mm -hmm. uh, look at those details, look and, and combine them with the general, the, the large scale grading plan. Because you may have to regrade a little bit to get it to work out the way it's pictured. The way, the way the designer intended it to be. You know, it's all, all the information is there, but you know, sometimes you have to put those pieces together and fit them nicely to get it exactly the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. In regards to, to, let me ask you a question. <coughs> With the details, too, um, I think we may have talked about it before. Um, I, I think with some of the systems, especially since, since they're not as well known, it is more benefit to instead of just having your standard detail on there, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, personalize it to that particular project um, just for the contractor and the inspector's better understanding of yeah. it. Um, yeah, yeah, we can't so, yeah. put that on. So what, he, what he's referring to is our uh, our pilot, let's call it, of trying to do a standard detail for a tree trench. Uh, he was luckily enough, lucky enough to have the first one. Uh, and I'm sure they'll improve from there. Um, the, the design of these systems costs money. Um, there's a soft cost that's part of it, and that goes into the overall cost of the, of the program. Um, we spend a lot of money on getting information, uh, presenting that information, on uh, going back and forth with the consultants. Um, before it gets to you, there's a year and a half of me sitting there, you know, redlining plans over and over and over again to get to the point where I think that we even have something that might be constructible. Um, we are going to try to get to the point where maybe we have a little bit less detail uh, and instead we have some set elevations and the same drawing that goes with some variables on that drawing. Like I said, luckily enough, you got to go to the first one uh, and we're trying to improve it going forward. But do expect to see that in the future. Do expect to see a you know, uh, one detail for a tree trench with a chart, a chart underneath with all the dimensions on it. Um, you'll still have a plan view with all the all the utilities and everything else. You'll still have a plan view with the footprint. Um, the difference here being that, in general, it takes us about a year and a half to finish. That project took me about four to five months to finish. Um, it wasn't perfect, uh, but we did it because we had to get underneath of the deadline for federal highway dollars. Um, but do get be prepared for that in the future and kind of, you know, sit down, kind of look at it. If you have questions during the bidding process, please call. I would much rather get the phone calls during the bidding process than after we've already given the bid out. Uh, we're definitely willing to kind of, you know, through our project's control, walk everything, everyone through what we have. When RFI comes in, everyone's going to get it. I'm sure everyone has the same questions. So, uh, I think that's about time. Um, so the future seminars that we're probably going to be uh, going over, um, so we're going to probably do some specification updates. Right now we're going through a contract to revamp the specifications. Um, there will be an intermediary spot right now that we're getting to where you'll have a new version coming out shortly. After that, we're going to go through a longer process to get to the point where we have something that uh, is a little bit tighter, um, maybe has some more up-to-date practices compared to what we're seeing. Um, Specification updates. We might be done, and we come to you and present what we have uh, for comment, or it might be us coming to you to get to maybe get some questions answered, so we can get those folded in. We want to make sure that we're presenting as much information as we can, so you can finish the project right. Um, you know, instead of interpreting the specifications, we'd rather they just say what we want them to say. Uh, it takes a little while; it's brand new, but I think we're closing in on what we want. Um, landscaping improvements might be another one. Uh, we're looking at a couple different ways to change our landscaping, either through doing pallets, so that'll be a standard detail, um, to you know using different materials, 
uh, to maybe adding some larger boulders in rather than doing something that's so soft. Uh, so it might be, once again, presenting to you what the changes are going to be, presenting some of the manuals that we've been developing, uh, or just going through questions and getting feedback from you so we can direct our efforts. Uh, thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's, like I said, this is kind of for us to help you, you to help us. Um, so as you come to these things, make sure you're, if you have any questions about the previous one, or the one before it, or just in general, please bring them with you so you can ask, uh, and we'd be happy to kind of fill in any of the blanks uh, and take any feedback. Thanks, guys.